Welcome to the world of Compututor. I'm Brent Seltzer. I congratulate you on the purchase of your new Radio Shack Model 4 microcomputer. It's an investment into your future that will pay for itself just as quickly as you learn to operate it. There are really only a couple of tough elements to deal with when learning to use a microcomputer. The first is getting it from the store to your home or office. Amazing, isn't it, how all these miniaturized high technology components always seem to come in a box that's just a little longer than the reach of your arms and just a little higher than the trunk of your car. However, you've now passed that first hurdle and from here on, it does get easier. Now, if you're concerned that you're gonna have to spend hours and hours of time learning computer technology theory just to operate your machine, relax. The object of this Compututor program is to teach you the basics of using your machine, not the basics of building it. Because trial and error is still the most effective method of education, this Compututor program is designed for you to play as often as you need to so that you can see any segment or specific operation of using your machine again and again until you're comfortable with the procedure. We recommend that you first watch this tape all the way through one time without trying to use your machine. That'll give you an opportunity to see what you'll be learning and what you'll require in the way of backup materials. Then, set up your computer, even if only temporarily in the same room with your video cassette machine and television, so that you can watch and participate on your machine at the same time. So, let's begin. Just imagine that by some good fortune, you're now the proud owner of the local library in your town. And all the librarians work for you bringing you any and all of the information stored in the thousands of books on the shelves and delivering that information in whatever kind of order or format you ask for. Now imagine that same library building and its team of librarians compressed to the size of the machine you just bought. Because like that library building, your computer can be filled with large amounts of information and instead of waiting hours, days, and sometimes weeks for that information, it takes only minutes. That's just what your computer is all about, the high-speed storage and retrieval of information. You might find it interesting to note that your microcomputer represents the sum total of over 150 years of research and development. That's true, over 150 years. See, back in 1834, a British mathematician named Charles Babbage invented a mechanical device that would eventually give birth to the first design of the first analytical computer. The machine he built was designed to add, subtract, multiply, and that all-time favorite, divide. However, this sort of Rube Goldberg contraption had a little trouble with the multiplying and dividing. That was because it was all moving parts that had to be precision made. So the first model tended to shake so hard during the multiplication and division process that it nearly fell off the table. A lot of years and a lot of effort went into making a more refined version of the computer. Along with that, by World War II, the engineers at Sperry Rand had developed an electric card sorting device that seemed to help. And from that warehouse full of parts came an even more refined version that in the late 1950s could actually sort through and then cross-index hundreds of cardboard cards called punch cards. The engineers called them punch cards because they had to punch little holes in them for the mechanical sorting process. You'll find that a lot of computer terms used today were invented for verbal convenience. And I'll be telling you a lot more about that as we go on. But giving credit where it's due, the first time Americans really had a chance to see a computer was back around 1958, thanks to veteran TV host Art Linkletter. He introduced UNIVAC on his Saturday night program, People Are Funny. The great electromechanical brain UNIVAC was used to match up single men with single women, all of whom were searching for ways not to be single. And so computer dating was born. I only mention this to you in case you think that computer people have no sense of romance. Oh, no. In fact, it was a very romantic way for a couple of movie characters played by Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn to meet in the film called Desk Set. From the late 50s right up to today, Hollywood has represented the computer in many different ways. From the flashing lights and spinning wheels of TV's Captain Video to the soft-spoken but black-hearted HAL 9000 of the sci-fi classic 2001 A Space Odyssey. Don't worry, your Radio Shack Model 4 is much more user-friendly than HAL. And right up to the lovable R2-D2 of Star Wars. 
The computer has been growing with all of us. As computers grew in stature, they shrunk in size. And today, the same kind of computer that took up two floors of a building just to match boyfriends and girlfriends on TV is no larger or even as powerful as the computer you're about to use. You know, a wise man once said, a thing is known by what it does. And what your computer will do for you is to store and retrieve large amounts of data in short periods of time. And the list of applications is virtually as long as your imagination is wide. Keep that in mind as you begin to discover how to use your Radio Shack Model 4 microcomputer. Now, before you begin to hook up your computer, I want to talk to you a bit about computer terminology. You remember a little earlier when I mentioned to you that getting the machine from the store to your home or office was among the more difficult aspects of using your computer? Here comes the second one, computer terminology. See, the inventors, designers, engineers, and builders of computers seem to have created a language of letters, numbers, and symbols that are as Greek to most of us as, say, Greek, come to think of it. For example, when you hear the term basic, you probably think of the word basic. Well, Webster's New World Dictionary defines the word basic as meaning fundamental or essential. However, when you hear the computer term basic, it's an acronym or a word formed from the letters of a series of words. BASIC, in computer terms, stands for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. And this is just one of the languages that is used to create the programs you run on your computer. You see, the engineers who designed and built these micro-wonders developed a kind of shorthand, abbreviated sentences into words and words into letters. But I think after a while, you'll be able to figure out a lot of these words for yourself. To show you how logically some of these terms came into existence, let's go over a few of the more common computer terms. For example, in a little bit, you'll learn to boot up your machine. Don't panic. All that means is starting with a computer that is powerless and turning on the power, preparing it to follow your commands. That's one of my favorite things about computers. You get to command them. Booting up is a term taken from the old mountaineer's expression for when climbers reach the end of the rope. They would use the straps off their climbing boots to make a loop on the rope, catch their foot in it, and start climbing up the rope again. So, when a computer program was written to start up the system of a computer, it took the name of the bootstrap program. When you boot up your computer, you're starting up the rope of computing. Earlier, I promised you no long technical lectures, and I'm going to keep that promise. So without putting you through a long series of diagrams, I thought you should know approximately how the computer works. Actually, it seems to work like your own brain. It has a central processing unit called the CPU, which coordinates all of the information and sends it where it should go. The information in a computer is stored in its memory, and that's like your memory. The computer has two kinds of memory. The first is called read-only memory, or ROM. Read-only memory is built into the machine, usually at the factory, and it's usually permanent, forever. It tells the machine how to be a machine. You have ROM, too. When you were born, you didn't have any real conscious memory or experience, but you knew how to breathe, make your heart pump, your eyes work, your fingers and toes move, and, of course, keep the diaper service busy. That was your survival memory. Well, in a sense, that's what ROM is all about. Next comes random access memory, or RAM. That's the part of the machine's memory that is accessible to all the information or experiences you put into it. It's like the experiences you remember since birth, or at least slightly thereafter. In the computer, RAM is the same thing. It's memory of what information you put in the machine on a day-to-day -day basis. I wanted to show you how the terms get created and the language of computerese is born. However, you don't need to use computerese to use a computer any more than you need to know how to strip a carburetor, flush a cooling system, or change the points and plugs of a car just to drive it. You learned how to boot up or turn on your hi-fi, and you figured out how to store or record movies and TV shows on the RAM of your videotape machine. So learning a few of these computer terms won't be that difficult. The best way to use this computer program is to stop the machine and rewind to any point and play it as many times as you want, allowing you to learn at your own pace. I'll be right here for you, until you put me back in the box. In the next segment, you'll be setting up your machine, so take a minute and think about where to put it. 
You should place the machine somewhere that's convenient and comfortable, a place where you have plenty of light and electrical outlets, the grounded kind with the three holes for the three-pronged plugs that come with the equipment. Also, pick a place that makes it easy for you to look directly at the monitor screen and put it at a height that's good for your hands. You don't want to get wrung out wrists after a short shot at the keyboard. By the way, you should know that extreme heat or cold is not fun for your computer. Temperatures above 90 degrees can cause your machine to crash, not, not on the floor. That's just a slang term for any time your machine stops operating properly. And that could cost you all the time and effort you've put into working on a particular program. The result is that you could lose whatever current material is in the machine's random access memory at that time. Temperatures below 60 degrees and your computer may be too cold to start, like a car on a winter day. And even if it does start, it could be very sluggish. So try to avoid putting your computer near hot air ducts, radiators, direct sunlight, and of course, moving glaciers. You should consider another thing called power spikes. You know that AC, or alternating current, comes through the electrical outlets in your home or office, and it does alternate. And sometimes when power goes up or down all of a sudden, which happens nearly every day, it could affect your computer. So the next time you go to the computer store, ask about a surge box. It plugs into the wall, your computer plugs into it, and that should prevent those power spikes from causing any problems. Something else to consider. Whether you own a home or rent, better call your insurance agent and make sure your insurance policy covers your computer. In most cases, your current insurance won't cover it. Last thing before we move on. Save all those cartons and packing materials your microcomputer came packed in. Just in case you discover a defect or problem with the machine in the next week or so. You'll find it a lot easier to take back in the box, easier to carry, and easier to get replaced. And don't forget to fill out all of those warranty cards and send them in to the manufacturer. At the beginning of our program, I congratulated you for getting your computer. Now, I congratulate you for sitting through this little orientation. Coming up, we'll be assembling the equipment and getting ready to use your machine. So you might want to stop the tape here, review this segment if you like, and find a place to put the machine. And maybe even take a quick break before moving on. Don't worry about me. I told my mom I'd be home late. Welcome back to Compututor. Did segment one whet your appetite? Good, because at the end of this segment, we'll order out. In this segment, you'll be taking a tour of your machine and then assembling the equipment in preparation to use it. Oh, there are a few things you should have standing by. Some diskettes, usually a box of 10 is a good start. Paper and ribbons for your printer and some cleaning supplies, such as a bottle of anti-static and a disk drive cleaning kit. If the salesperson at the store didn't sell you these things, give them another chance. All right, let's get down to business. You may have already removed your computer from its packing carton and have it completely assembled. Maybe the salesperson at the store assembled it for you. Even so, it might be a good idea to stay with this part of our program. It'll give you a chance to make sure that you have all the information down pat. Look at all this stuff. You know, you could read any one of billions and billions of different technical books about the internal workings of a computer. However, there is a much simpler way to approach this information. Imagine the inside of a computer being much like the inside of a human body. At the head of the computer is the central processing unit, the CPU. It's the real brain of the computer. It directs all of the information in and out of the main memory, where all the read-only memory, ROM, and the random access memory, RAM, is stored. The power pack inside the computer is like the heart of the body, pumping power, like blood, in appropriate amounts to all elements of the computer. To learn more about it, check the owner's manual description on page one, which explains in more technical detail the inner workings of your machine. Now here come some of those computer terms. Hardware and software, what are they? What's the difference? Well. 
Hardware refers to the machine and its peripherals. A peripheral is anything that plugs into the computer, like the disk drives, or the printer, or the screen. They're all pretty hard, and so they're called hardware. Software is the reference to the programs you run on your computer, which come on these diskettes called floppy disks. We call them floppy disks because, well, they're kind of floppy. I'll be talking more about that a little later on in our program. I think the easiest way to relate to the difference between the two, hardware and software, is your videotape machine. The cassette machine itself with the tuner timer, that's the hardware. The actual video cassettes you put in the machine, that's like the floppy diskette that holds the software. And the movies or TV shows you record on the cassette, that's like the program instructions we call software. The biggest thing you'll notice is the television screen or the monitor. You can call it either one. And then, of course, there's the favorite technical term, the CRT. That stands for cathode ray tube. In fact, that happens to be the name of every television picture tube. But don't go looking for the late show on your micro computer. In a way, the CRT is really like the mouth of the computer. When the machine wants to communicate with you, it does all of its talking right here on the screen. Down here is the keyboard, sometimes called the keypad. It looks just like a typewriter keyboard because it is just like a typewriter keyboard. You'll notice that most of the keys look just like a typewriter keyboard, and there are a few others that don't. In a little while, we'll tour that keyboard and show you what all those keys are for. You will speak to your computer through the keyboard. That's how it hears you, giving it commands. Now, don't bother talking to it. You'll have to press the keys to get your message across. Here are the disk drives. They're kind of like little record players that record as well, so you can store information and bring it out again and again. It's in these little disk drives that the floppy disks do their business. In fact, you could think of these little disk drives as filing rooms, and the floppy disks as the file cabinets, and the material you store on the floppy diskettes as the actual files. Right now, let's put our attention on the hardware. Now, because you won't be able to pass through the television screen and sit here at this machine to get the hands-on experience, I want you to meet my assistant, Das Mitz. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. You look terrific. Love the manicure. Here on the videotape, he'll be playing your part. Of course, you'll appear live in your own home version. See, by watching our friend, you'll be able to see what he's doing, which is usually what you should be doing. Now let's get all this equipment assembled. The nice folks at Radio Shack wanted to make sure you didn't have any difficulty with the assembly. So, they assembled it all for you. The only thing you have to hook up yourself is the printer. You'll have to turn your machine over just like we did so that you can take the attachment cord that came with your printer and look at the back underside of your machine for what would be the upper slot in the back right side. That's right. Now you have a parallel printer and the outside of the connector looks like a flat bar. Well, line it up with the slot opening on the far right side in the bottom back of the machine and plug it in gently. If it doesn't fit in, don't force it. Make sure it's lined up and try it again. Good. Now take the other side of your printer connector cord, which sort of looks like a big letter D, and attach it in the same way to the printer. Good. Now plug both devices into a three-pronged wall outlet or a surge box, and you're ready to go. You'll notice in the center of the machine, there's another connection. It's for a telephone modem. That's a device that's used for sending information to and from your computer over telephone lines. Well, you've done a great job putting your machine together. You should rerun this segment of Compututor one more time to make sure. Or you might want to read over pages 4 through 8 of your Radio Shack owner's manual regarding assembly. Otherwise, why not take a break before we boot up and learn the general machine operation? If you like, you can head out to the kitchen for a bite to eat. I wouldn't mind that myself before we go into the next segment of Compututor. <sighs> The 
this is dry. I asked you for mustard. You ordered it dry, and then you stick me with it. Welcome back to Compututor. In our last segment, you really put it all together equipment-wise. And now it's time to boot up and go to work, because now you're ready to turn on your machine. If you had the disk operating system diskette or any other program diskette in the drive, you'd only have to turn on the switch. For the purposes of our keyboard tour, you'll be turning on the machine without the disk operating system first, so that you can take part in a few exercises. The off-on switch is located under the lip of the right side of the keyboard. However, because there will be no diskette in the drive when we turn on or boot up the machine in this segment, you must press the brake key on the upper right-hand corner of the keyboard and hold it down as you turn on the switch. The lower drive briefly makes a whirring noise as the little red light goes on and then in a few seconds off, now everything has stopped. By the way, we've labeled the disk drive 0 and 1 to make it easier for you to see which is which. If these things didn't happen, turn off your machine and wait 30 seconds and then repeat the sequence again. If it still doesn't work, call your Radio Shack dealer because you might need help from the service department. Up in the left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see the phrase CASS, C-A-S-S, -S, with a question mark at the end and it's printed twice. That refers to using a cassette machine for information storage. You'll be using disk drives, so just press the Enter key on the right side of the keyboard twice until the screen display looks like this. Now, don't panic if your machine reads Radio Shack Model 3 Basic. You do have a Model 4, but it is capable of using Model 3 software. You can adjust the brightness and the contrast of the screen with the controls just under the left side and slightly behind the keyboard. Notice this flashing line or block. It's called the cursor, that's a pointer, and it's used to point to what comes next or where the next character will appear. You're ready to start learning your keyboard. As we mentioned earlier, it looks like a typewriter keyboard that has a bunch of extra keys. Now. Type in your name, just to get the feel of the keyboard. Type it as though you were using a regular typewriter. Kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, well, here's another good exercise. Press a letter key, any key, and hold it down. F is a good key. See how the machine keeps printing out the letter? See, the longer you hold any character, letter, or number key down, the longer it continues to print on the screen. Now, let's try using one of the arrow keys. We'll try the left arrow key and see what happens. The longer you hold that left arrow key down, the more the cursor keeps moving to the left and erasing the letters you've typed. In most programs, using the left and right arrow keys allows you to move the cursor through a word, and this is very handy for making corrections. Now, it's not too likely you would misspell your name, but some folks do, and if you did, it would be easy to just use the left arrow key, sometimes called the backspace key, to erase the misspelled parts of the word and then retype the correct version. You can erase any characters to the right that could be left over in most programs just by pressing the space bar. The longer you press it down, the more spaces it erases, and when there are no characters to erase, the space bar just moves the cursor to the right. Now, the up and down arrow keys, like the right and left arrow keys, will move the cursor in whatever position the arrow is pointing in most programs. Because you are in basic and not running a program at this moment, those keys will not move the cursor at this time. I'd like to pass on a few words to you on the subject of mistakes and errors. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to make them. Your computer won't breathe a word to a soul. You see, getting used to using a computer requires you to make a certain amount of errors. You see, the machine is very specific about things like which letters, numbers, or symbols you should use. For example, on a typewriter, you could use a small L for the number one, and it would look the same. But to a computer, a small L is only a small L, and the number one is only the number one. When you make mistakes, the computer will tell you with an error message. It will give you the error message with either a series of numbers or words noting specifically what the error is all about. They're referred to as the error codes. In your Radio Shack owner's manual on pages 32 through 34, you'll find a list of some of those error codes. What we'll do here is give you a rundown of what all the keys do. Then we'll add some software in the next segment and let you see some examples. 
first, I'm going to show you where things are on the keyboard so that when we put a diskette with the program in the machine and boot up, you'll know where to put your fingers when the instructions are given. Press down on each key as we talk about it. However, until a program is in the machine, don't expect the kind of result I'll be talking about right now. Notice that the keys look like the keys on a regular typewriter, and essentially they are. All the black keys are just like they appear, letters, numbers, and symbols. It's the white keys you need to know about now. You can see the two white shift keys are there, and they're like the shift keys on a typewriter, and perform the same function. Notice the two keys on either side of the space bar. The one on the far right is marked caps for caps lock, and like the caps lock on a typewriter, it locks the machine into uppercase print. On the left is the CTRL, or control key. When pressed with other keys, it makes the machine perform all sorts of functions. Over to the right side of the keyboard is the enter key. It's the big one. It's like the return key of an electric typewriter in that it moves the cursor to the beginning of the next line. And in many programs, it signals the machine that you have completed putting some information in and it's time for the computer to perform its function. By the way, there's another enter key over at the lower right corner of the numerical keypad. It's added strictly as a convenience. Now, back over next to the big enter key is the clear key. Aside from clearing the screen, it's used to delete things from the screen, which is very helpful in editing or changing responses in certain common programs. And up in the corner is the brake key. And just like the brakes on your car, it will stop the computer in its tracks when running certain programs. Further to the right, you'll see another set of number keys with a period or a decimal key. It's the numerical keypad. It looks like a calculator keypad, and when you're doing a lot of mathematical calculations, it allows you to enter the numbers in much of the same way you would on a standard calculator. Above those keys, you'll see three keys marked F1, F2, F3. They are the function keys, and they're designed to allow you to order the computer to perform a whole group of commands with the stroke of a single key. The last thing to show you on this keyboard is the orange reset button up here on the far right. It's like the reset switch on a fuse box, and it's used to boot up without having to keep turning the machine on and off. Now, let's talk about the disk drives. They hold the software, data, and programs that you'll be moving in and out of your machine. In case you're not sure what programs are, they're like instructions that tell the machine what to do. Make sure you never open a drive and try to take a diskette out while the red light is on or while the diskette is moving inside. You'll damage the diskette, and you won't do the drive a whole lot of good either. Before you boot up, I think you should know that a disk operating system, or DOS, pronounced like TOS, is like an office manager who takes responsibility for seeing to it that certain files are kept, stored, and used in a certain way. The office manager gives the other clerical people in the office all the policies and directions on how to handle the work so it coordinates with your needs. Well, that's what your disk operating system does. Just as you direct your office manager to use certain uniform commands to the office staff that keeps control over how work is done, the DOS is a collection of programs that give special commands to the machine and to your programs to ensure the material is where you want it and the way you want it. When you put the DOS diskette in the machine, close the drive door, and then boot up, the cursor will appear next to a prompt. In this case, it will be the word date with a question mark. But any prompt is like a prompter in a high school play who tells you that you're on or what's next. The prompt is asking for a command. It may be asking for some information first, say the date. In the next segment, I'll be telling you to boot up your machine with your disk operating system diskette in the lower drive, and we'll get started with some hands-on usage. But just for fun, let's take a look at a diskette. I'll just open one of these guys up and show you what's inside. It's kind of very tightly sealed. Well, it's supposed to be that way to protect any little help here. To... Oh, there you have it. As you can see, it's just a little record inside a little record jacket. Only you, you leave it in the jacket. Don't you ever do this because you won't be able to use the diskette again. In fact, you must make a point of not touching the diskette in any of these exposed locations. And when you're holding a diskette, be gentle. It will be better for both you and the diskette if you hold it lightly on the outside edges.
it won't be in danger of being damaged, and you won't be in danger of having to buy another one to replace it. I can just put this one on my expense account, in case I ever get one. As you can see, it's just a little record in a little record jacket. Notice how the sleeve has an oblong hole. It's cut on both sides of the diskette. And when the diskette is in the drive and spinning around, the drive reads the material off the diskette from here and moves it into the system in the central processing unit. This is also the place that the system writes material onto the disk. Now notice this notch here on the paper sleeve. If you cover this notch with the little stickers that come with the diskettes, as you can see, it prevents the diskette from being erased accidentally. You can remove the tab, see, if you ever decide to use the diskette for something else later. So if you already have something on the diskette and don't want to lose it, use the sticker to protect it. Also, label it accordingly. The labels come in the box with the diskettes. On the subject of labeling your diskettes, unless you're intending to first type or write the labels before you put them on the diskette, you should always use a felt tip pen to do your labeling. That way, you won't take a chance of damaging the diskette by pressing too hard on the surface. Your label should consist of the name you want to call the diskette, the program you're working with, and the date you started the diskette. In a little while, you'll be backing up or copying diskettes, and you'll have a chance to see it all working. Backing up or copying diskettes is very important. You see, a floppy disk has a 40-hour life expectancy. Of course, when you read and write a diskette, the process only takes a few seconds. And when you divide that into the diskette's life expectancy, well, 40 hours could last you a very long time. But floppies can be fragile, and anything can get misplaced or mishandled. So, making backup copies is like having carbon copies, or more accurately, duplicate originals. We suggest that you make two backups of every disk you have. One for general use, and one is to be called a fire copy. That fire copy is the one you might want to store in a fireproof location, like a safe deposit box, or some sort of fireproof box in a safe location away from the machine. Now, before we end this segment, I've got some new terms for you. Bit and byte. A bit is an acronym for a binary digit, B-I-T. Eight of these little bits make a byte, B-Y-T-E. And a byte is equal to one character. So if you have 100 bytes, you have about 100 characters. But with computers, even a blank space takes a byte. Almost all the computers you'll see offer space in thousands of bytes, or kilobytes. That's the metric measurement of approximately 1,000 bytes, actually 1,024 bytes. The number of bytes available in your random access memory, or main memory, RAM, tells you just how much material you can put into the machine's memory. If your machine has 64K, that means you have 64 kilobytes. If you want to take that a step further, if you were to fill out a page of text, like a letter or a report, you would be able to put about 2,000 bytes, or 2K, on a page. That means a machine with 64K RAM would hold about 32 to 34 pages of text in the machine before you have to store it. Of course, some of that space might be used by the program that helped you type in the text. And that brings us to storage, very important, because the memory is like a blackboard that is only so big. And when you fill it up, you either have to store it away and then bring out another blackboard, like a floppy disk, or you can just erase it, start all over again. Well, you get the idea. Storing the blackboard is done by commanding the machine to save the material in the memory on a diskette, which you'll learn to do in just a little bit. Uh, bit of time, that is. In a few minutes, we'll be booting up that DOS diskette in the zero or lower drive, showing you the major commands and even running a useful program. But you've been working real hard, and you should be congratulated. First, review this last segment of CompuTutor, then relax before we begin using your machine in the next segment. Maybe you just want to get up and walk around or uh, oh, take a stretch or uh, a look out the window in case it's raining outside. Of course, if it's raining inside, you could skip the window.
Welcome back to Compututor. In our last segment, we toured the equipment and ran down the keys on the keyboard. Now, let's get started loading that DOS diskette into the lower or zero drive of your system. That's the one you saw light up its little red light earlier. First, make sure the lever-like door of the drive is open. It should be left open except when a diskette has been put in. Let's get ready to load the diskette by taking it out of its little jacket there. All right, you want to load the diskette with the label facing up and out. That's correct. Just gently slide it on in and then close the lever-like door behind it. See, if you don't close the door, the drive won't work. Now you're going to have an opportunity to boot up your machine with the disk operating system using the reset procedure rather than having to turn it off and on again. Also, you'll be learning a series of procedures and commands or instructions that you give the machine. And this is where the DOS or disk operating system comes in real handy. That's right. Some of the most important procedures and commands are called directory to let you see what's on the disk. Copy for copying single programs or pieces of data. Backup for making complete copies of entire diskettes. Format for preparing the diskettes to hold information. After a diskette has been formatted, it can become a data diskette. Remove is the command used to remove a file or piece of data from a diskette. Save is the basic language command used to save a program that's in the machine. And load is another basic language command that brings a program or file from a diskette into the machine. Now, as I mentioned to you, save and load are both basic program commands. That is, used for programs written in the basic language. The first command you'll learn is called directory. It's the command that lets you see what programs or files may already be on the disk. So you'll know what to ask for. Now, let's boot up the machine with the DOS diskette in the lower or zero drive. To do this, simply press the reset key and the machine will take care of the rest. Excellent, excellent, great technique, terrific wrist. You've got such discipline and control. I'm really pleased with your progress, you know. Notice how the cursor is flashing at the bottom of the center of your CRT next to the word date with a question mark there. The machine is telling you that before the program can go any further, you have to put in the date. You must do it in a specific fashion. Type in the two-digit number of the month. Now, if the number of the month has only one digit, like, say, April, don't type in a four. Type in a zero and a four, then a slash mark. Follow that with the day number of the month, which also gets a zero first if there isn't two numbers, and a slash mark. Finally, add the last two digits of the current year and press the Enter key. Then you'll see the date displayed in the conventional manner. Now you're ready to begin giving your machine commands. What we're going to show you are the commands you need to know for using pre-written software. Again, these are the major commands. Directory, copy, backup, format, remove, and how to run programs. Let's start with directory, or DIR. Type in the command DIR and press the Enter key. You'll see the red light on the disk drive light, and the drive will make a whirring sound. And the information on the screen will move up. What you're looking at is the directory of programs available on the diskette. By typing in the command to see the directory of the program, you made the screen move. Well, that's called scrolling. And the best explanation of scrolling I can think of is this. In ancient times, you know, before the invention of the paper cutter and the copying machine, the written word was put on scrolls, like this one. Uh, except, of course, they were older. A long piece of parchment or paper-like material, sometimes with pieces of wood on the top and bottom. The scroll was rolled up, and you would have to roll it in both directions to move the scroll up or down. Kind of noisy, isn't it, for the written word? Well, information sometimes rolls up and down on your CRT just like that. So the smart folks who invented computers figured since it seemed like having a scroll in your computer, they would call it scrolling. If you look at the screen, here's what you see. The first line tells you which disk drive directory you're looking at which in this case is zero. 
It then tells you what diskette you're reading. In this case, the Trista 60 diskette. And it gives you an incredible amount of technical information, which means you have good equipment and plenty of room for files. And of course, the date the disk was created. Below that is the list of programs called files. Notice how some of them have a word or what looks like a word that tells you the program name, followed by a slash, and then followed by a three-letter code that tells you the kind of program. This is occasionally followed by the letter P. That tells you it's protected and can't be erased. Notice that because you have nothing in the other disk drives, it says no disk. If you count three extra drives, and you realize you only have one or two, it's because your computer can take up to four disk drives. Directory is the command that shows you what's on a disk. If you have a disk and you're not sure what's on it, directory is the first command you might run. The next command, and truly one of the most important, is format. You see, floppy disks are sometimes called flimsy disks, and it pays to duplicate the programs on your disk with a backup. But first, you have to format a blank diskette. The command format will organize your blank diskette into a filing system in which you can put your disk files. Like a file cabinet with empty files in empty drawers just waiting to be filled up with your information. So take out a blank diskette now. Very good. By the way, it's a good practice to put a label on the diskette first, even if you don't fill the label out yet. That way you won't mistake it for an unformatted diskette. Very good. Great technique. Really top notch. Now I want you to take that disk with the label up and out and slide it into the upper or number one drive and close that lever-like door of the drive. Good. To make it easier for you to see the formatting procedure, let's press down the caps lock key just to the right of the space bar. Now everything will be in upper case. All right, proceed as follows. Type in the command word format. Now, a space, a colon, followed by the number one. Next, type an opening parenthesis with the letter Q, an equal sign, and the letter N, followed by a closing parenthesis. Now, press the Enter key. The formatting process has begun. And when it is complete, the machine will say, formatting complete. Then you will see the Tristos Ready signature with the cursor flashing underneath. This is the quickest method of formatting a diskette. And while the diskette is being formatted, you will see the words formatting and verifying on the screen. This just means that the machine is reading information from the disk in drive zero, that's the lower drive, and it's writing all the material onto the disk in drive one, the upper drive. Then it verifies to make sure the information is accurate. By reading over pages 1-94 through 1-98 in the larger Radio Shack owner's manual, you'll find a more detailed explanation of the formatting procedure. We want to make a data disk. And a data disk can be used to make a backup or as a receiver disk for data or other programs. In just a few seconds, the process will be complete. Formatting is complete, and you can see down in the corner of your screen the Tristos Ready signature and the flashing cursor. Now the diskette is ready to be used with the command backup. You see, saving those files is important because after you've made a backup disk or two, You'll put the original disk away and keep using the backups. Here's how you command the machine to back up that disk. Type in the command word. Are you ready? Here it comes. Backup. Now add a space, then a colon, followed by a zero. Now another space. Type in the word two, T-O. Add another space, a colon, and the number one. You're telling the machine to take the files from the diskette in drive zero and back them up to the diskette in drive one. After you've typed all this information in, press the Enter key.
Now, if you take a look, the machine then tells you that the destination disk identification is different. The name, an equal sign, data disk, the date, and then it asks you if you're sure you want to back up to it. In the brackets are your choices, Y for yes and N for no. Now, don't worry about this message. You didn't make a mistake, and neither did the machine. It's just an extra safety precaution to keep you from accidentally backing up over information you may need. Press the letter Y and the Enter key. At this point, you'll see the machine loading and verifying and writing or dumping material onto the diskette in drive one. When it's done, the screen will read backup complete and Tristos ready. And of course, beneath the Tristos ready signature, you'll see the flashing cursor. However, this procedure does take a few seconds and you should be patient. This might be a good opportunity for you to do something else. You might want to finish up that scale model of Detroit you were making with toothpicks and sugar cubes. On the other hand, maybe you don't. In any event, no, okay, fine. Well, it'll only take a few seconds for this process to be complete. And though it seems like you're waiting, it's still faster than trying to do your work without a computer. Be patient. Notice that after material is loaded in, it is then verified to make sure that it is written accurately on your receiver or backup diskette. The backup is complete, and there in the corner of your screen is the Tristos Ready signature and the flashing cursor. You know, this is a good time to ensure that the backup was successful. And that's easy to do. Just ask for the directory on disk drive one. Type in the command phrase DIR, a space, a colon, followed by the number one, and press enter. If the backup isn't good, you won't get a directory. But there's your directory, and the backup was good. Now, I want you to take that master disk out of the zero drive and put it away. Very good. You see, what we're going to do is to take the copy from the upper or number one drive out, and we're going to label this one Tristas Backup. Go ahead. Oh, you need a pen? Here, have this one. Don't mention it. You see, we're going to put the copy from the number one drive down here into the zero drive. A felt tip pen is always a must when labeling your diskettes. Go ahead and put it in the zero drive, and don't forget to close the little lever-like door. Very good. You've now learned that you can command your computer to show you a diskette's programs by typing DIR and pressing the Enter key. You can load and run a program just by typing in the program name and then pressing the Enter key. As an example, we can run the program that will give you the screen you saw when you booted up your DOS diskette originally. Type in the word boot and press the Enter key. You are now looking at the opening screen of Radio Shack's bootstrap program. If you want to see how much free space for files and programs you have on your disks in any drive, type in the word free and press the enter key. The machine tells you the drive number, the disk name, and the date. The available free space versus total space measured in kilobytes, and the number of file locations available versus the number of file locations actually used. Now put a blank diskette in the number one or upper drive and go ahead and format it. Don't worry, I'll clean that up for you. We'll be using it in just a minute. When the machine directs you to give a command or add any information to a command, make sure you spell it and type it exactly as it appears. When you misspell a command or phrase, the machine does not recognize it, and so it's as though no real command has been given. 
Now let's try out what we've learned by running a program. Now that you have a formatted diskette and a backup diskette, you've learned most of the commands of the disk operating system. Just for fun, let's run a real useful program and save the data. Once you've accomplished this, you can use the same technique for other programs. We'll pick a real useful program like, say, mailing list. Type in the directory command DIR and press the enter key. Now, if you look over on the second column of your directory, you'll see a program called Mail List. Because you're going to run a program that is written in the basic language, first, you must load the basic language into the machine. Type in the word basic and press the enter key. The basic language is now being loaded from your disk operating system into the machine. Now, type in the basic command word, load, followed by a quotation mark. The word, mail list, and another quotation mark. Now press the Enter key. The basic language program mail list is now being loaded into the machine. When the machine says ready, type the word run and press the enter key again. By doing this, you have commanded the machine to both load and run a program. You could have just typed in run a quotation mark, the program name, another quotation mark, and pressed enter, and the program would have automatically loaded and run. However, you should be familiar with both of those commands, because those two basic language commands, load and run, mean just what they say. Now you see a list of options. We call that a menu. Like a restaurant menu that gives you a selection of food to eat, this menu gives you a selection of commands to give. The first, or number one, is Add Entry. Number two is Change Entry. Number three is Delete Entry. Number four is List the Information to the Screen. Number five is List the Information to your Printer. And number six says Return to Tristos, meaning you're finished with the program, and ready to go back to the disk operating system. Type in the number one. Notice you didn't have to press enter? That's because the program told the machine to automatically move on to the function that you asked for. Certain programs will do that. Now the screen has the instruction add entry, starting with the name. The cursor is moved up to the name location. Now type in your own name. and press the enter key. Don't forget, if you make a mistake, use the left arrow key to go back and correct your error. When you have the line correct, then you use the enter key. As you do, the program now asks for the address. The line one in parentheses means that you can use that space for a company name or an in care of name. Skip that line if you like just by pressing enter. When you do, you'll see a line two. Start typing in your street address. When you're done, press Enter. Now the program asks for your city, state, and zip code. Use abbreviations if you have to to save space and type that in. When you're done with the line, of course, press Enter. Now the machine is asking for a phone number. 
All those letter ends in parentheses are set up that way to show you the format of writing in the number. First, the three-digit area code. Then a dash. Then the three-digit prefix. Another dash. And finally, the last four digits of the number. Then press the Enter key. At the end of each total entry, the program asks you to press Enter to add another entry, or the letter M to return to the main menu. Try adding a few more names, addresses, and phone numbers. In fact, take a moment or two to put me on hold and do that. And when you have a few names in the machine, I'll show you how to make changes. Go ahead. Remember, to add another name, press the Enter key again. Let's just say that this is your last entry. And of course, after your last entry, you should type in M to bring you back to the main menu. Go ahead. Suppose you want to change an entry. Press the number two key for the change entry option. Now the program is asking you which entry you want changed. Let's say you want your third entry changed. Type in the number three, followed by the Enter key. At the bottom of the screen, the program asks you to type in the number of the line you want changed. In this case, it's line three. Type in line three. Now, you can type in the proper version of that line. Go ahead. and press the Enter key. The machine will then ask you if you want to change another line. If not, type an N for No, otherwise a Y for Yes. Type an N for No. By the time you type in that N for No, the machine says, press Enter to change another entry, or M to return to the main menu. Let's go back to the main menu by typing in an M. Now let's assume you want to delete an entry. Press the number 3 for delete entry. That's because you're taking this person off your list. And let's say it's the second entry that you put in. Type in the number 2 and press Enter. The machine shows you the entry you're planning to delete and asks you if you're sure. It gives you a choice, Y for yes and N for no. Type in Y for yes and the machine tells you that the entry is gone. It's time to press M and head back to the main menu. Now we have three options left on this menu. 
Option four is to see the listings on the screen. Option five is to send them to the printer. And option six is to go back to your disk operating system called Tristos. Type in number four to list the entry to the screen. Now we'll enter one of the names or numbers of the listing. Let's say listing number one. Type in the number one and press the enter. And there is your first listing. Now let's go back to the main menu by typing in the letter M and pressing the enter key. We're ready to leave the program and go back to the disk operating system. So press option number six. Down in the corner, you see the Tristos Ready signature. Without having your fingers leave your hands, you actually created a new file called mail list data, which looks like mail list slash dat and a plus mark. Hard to describe, but I'm going to show it to you. Run your directory command to find it. Type in DIR and press the enter key. Be sure your empty formatted diskette is in the number one or upper drive because you're about to copy the mail list data file from the diskette in drive zero to the diskette in drive one. It's easy to copy a file just by telling the machine to copy. Type in the command word copy, a space, the word mail list, a slash mark, the letters DAT for data, a colon, and a zero. Now a space, the word to, T-O, another space, the word mail list, another slash mark, the letters DAT, a colon, and the number one. You are telling the machine to copy the mail list data file from the diskette in drive zero, the lower drive, to the diskette in drive one, the upper drive. Now, press the enter key. In just a few seconds, you'll find it. There is one other critical command you must consider. What if you want to remove some program or data file because, well, for one reason or another, it just turns you off. You remove programs with the command remove. Clever, this computer terminology, isn't it? Okay. Now I want you to remove the mail list data file you just copied on the formatted disk. Simply type in the command word remove a space the word mail list, a slash mark, the letters DAT for data, a colon, and the number one, and press enter. Now, Check the directory again, like you did before. It should look like this. Well, you've worked your way through the disk operating system and even a useful program. Run the segment again right now, only next time you run it, don't remove the mail list data program because we'll be printing the mail list program in our next segment. Also, consult the smaller white owner's manual from pages 5 through 12 regarding the keyboard and check pages 13 to 21 on the disk operating system and commands. You can check those pages and run this segment several times before we move on. It's okay with me. After all, Pete's waiting around in the box. I'm so lonely here. No one comes by. All along, no call. Mom, Mom, I told you.
told you four segments ago I was going to be home late. I, I got to go, Mom. Welcome back to Compututor. So far, we've learned to assemble your Radio Shack Model 4 and boot up with the DOS, or Disk Operating System, and have been through the important commands and procedures, such as directory, or seeing what files are on the disk, copying a complete disk, and removing a program, saving files, loading a program, running a program. We've even run a useful program. Even though we've seen the option on the program menu that allows you to order up a printed version of your mailist program, we've yet to talk about your printer options. Let's do that now. The purpose of your printer is to make a written or hard copy version of the material you've put into your computer. Certain printers are more appropriate for certain jobs. Most of you probably bought a printer when you bought your computer, so you should know there are really two kinds of printers you'd be interested in, dot matrix and letter quality. Dot matrix is the most common. The little printing mechanism inside is a series of pins, usually five across and seven down, or nine across and nine down. That series of pins makes a matrix of little dots on the paper, hence the name dot matrix printer. When you use the print option of any program and the hard copy or printout begins, here's what happens. The printer takes the characters from the machine and then prints out the letters on paper in much the same way as lights in a stadium scoreboard show the scores. The more pins you have, the better looking your printout. The speed of most printers is measured by the number of characters, that's letters, numbers, and symbols, it can print out in a second. The number of characters per second, or CPS, on a good dot matrix printer can be as many as 400 or as little as 30. That means you could fill a page of copy anywhere from 10 seconds to just over a minute. This makes the dot matrix very handy when you want to get a hard copy or printout on a program very quickly. You can buy a dot matrix printer that will handle average size paper of 8.5 by 11. That translates out to about 60 to 132 characters across the page. Of course, that depends on the size of the characters and the kind of program you're running. You can also buy a dot matrix printer with a carriage large enough to handle paper 15 inches wide with 132 characters or more across the page. Maybe you've seen some of those large printouts. Of course, the smaller the printer, the less it costs. And dot matrix printers are considerably less expensive than letter quality or daisy wheel printers. This daisy wheel or letter quality printer doesn't use the dot matrix formation. The characters are taken from this little wheel. Here, I'll show you. It's called a daisy wheel. The printout you get from a daisy wheel printer looks like it was typed on a typewriter, just like any piece of office correspondence. That's where the expression letter quality comes from. However, the letter quality printer takes longer to fill the page, and the speeds will vary from 10 to 55 characters per second. And therefore, you may be trading off speed for the appearance of the print and price. Now let's talk about loading paper into your printer. A common method is tractor feed. That looks like this. I want you to notice these holes on the sides of the paper. That's for the tractor system. You can easily pull these parts away from the page. Watch. See, there's nothing to it. So simple, so easy. Noticing that my fingers never leave my hands. There you have it, a standard sheet of paper. This is the system you're most likely to use with your dot matrix printer. Using this dot matrix printer, I'll give you an idea how the paper is loaded. By moving the paper through the back of your printer, it will catch on to the pins of the tractor feed device. Then you can roll it through with the roller handle for the platen. When you load paper into the printer, whether it is continuous run or tractor feed, or single sheet as in friction feed, you should always make sure that the top of the sheet is at the top of the printer head. This is called top of the form, or TOF. That will ensure that each sheet of paper that follows will be set to the top. And if you ever get into using some pre-printed forms, it's one of the best ways to keep your place on the form. Another nice thing about using tractor feed paper is that you can buy it in a box with, get ready for this, as much as 2,000 sheets in a box, which is eminently more than I have here. If you need paper with a letterhead, you can find companies or stationers who'll make up this kind of paper with your letterhead on it. 
If blank paper will do the job for you, then you'll save money and time. With a letter quality printer, you'll probably use the friction feed process. That just means it loads like a typewriter. The paper is loaded into the daisy wheel just like a typewriter. And the tight friction from the platen or roller will hold it in place. Daisy wheel printers can also take tractor feed paper, but you must purchase a tractor feed device. You can also buy a sheet feeding device that will allow you to use a large quantity of your regular stationery. Now let's go back to that mail list program from the last segment. We'll assume you need a printout for your records. Here's an example of how the dot matrix will handle the job. First, run the mail list program. Notice option number five, list to printer. Press number five. The program is asking you if you want to include the phone numbers in the material you list to the printer. Y for yes, N for no. Make your selection, press the appropriate letter, and the printing process begins. Now here's that same listing printed out on a letter quality printer. So whether it's an important business report or just a friendly letter, you have the option of having it look almost any way you want. You should know that it's possible with the dot matrix to rearrange the typeface or font by adding some program instructions. Or if you decide to go the route of the daisy wheel, you can choose, in some cases, between as many as 40 different typefaces or fonts. Some folks like to have both printers, the dot matrix for fast printouts, graphics, and charts, and the daisy wheel for correspondence and reports. After you've considered speed, noise, price, and quality, you should consider one other factor, interface. That's the piece of equipment that allows your computer to talk with your printer. You see, not all printers will interface or hook up with any computer. If you don't already have a list of compatible printers, ask your dealer to give you one. Oh, while I'm on the subject of compatible printers, there are two kinds of printer interfaces, serial and parallel. The difference is the way they handle characters. The serial printer, like a single lane highway, takes only one bit of the byte or character at a time through the system. The parallel printer, like an eight lane highway, carries eight bits or a full byte or character through the line. Taking this a step further, the serial printer is a more standard hookup, whereas the parallel printer is a more unique hookup. And what that means to you is that you'll have to be very sure that the parallel printer and its patch cord are specifically intended for your computer and printer combination. The serial printer is more likely to hook up with any computer and printer combination, although it may take some switch adjustments that your dealer can help you with. Whichever printer you have or are intending to add to your system, just make sure you get a cable or patch cord that will fit your machine in the locations we showed you on the back of your computer back in segment two. Finally, make sure you read through the owner's manual that came with your printer and be sure you understand how to set the top of the form or TOF. Most important, if you're not sure about your printer options, check with your local dealer because different printers have different options. Getting the printed copy the way you want it is important and you might find it helpful to check with more than one computer store. Also, check out a few good stationery stores to make sure you can get a good selection of tractor feed paper 
if you're buying a dot matrix printer. Now that we've covered setting up and booting up your computer, running a useful program with the disk operating system, and getting a hard copy version, we'll tie it all together in the next segment with the important element of software. You can review this segment right now, or if you like, deal yourself a little break time before we begin the final segment of Compututor. You're kidding. I can't believe this. I can't believe you keep doing this to me. We have to talk. We have to talk real seriously. This can't go on. I thought we were just playing for fun, passing time, friendly game. All right, uh, how much do I owe you? That much, huh? Welcome back to Compututor. Once again, I congratulate you. You've really covered a lot of ground learning just how simple it is to use your hardware and how to operate the software. Software is what your computer is all about. Just like your video cassette player would be of little value to you without any video cassettes to play, such is the case with your computer. Earlier on in segment four, I told you we would talk at greater length about software and programs. Well, this is that time. It's not necessary to know how to write programs to get value out of your computer. In fact, out of any given group of 100 computer users, that's you, only five people will have any interest in writing programs. More than likely, you'll be using software or programs that have already been written and published to fulfill your needs. You should know there are virtually thousands of different software programs, from games to accounts receivable and accounts payable. However, the three most commonly used and in-demand kinds of software are Calc, or the Electronic Spreadsheet, Word Processing, and Database Management. At some time or another, these are the three kinds of software you'll probably be looking to use on your personal microcomputer. I'd like to tell you just a bit about them. Let's start with Calc. Calc is short for calculations, and it's an electronic worksheet. You would use this the same way you might use a sheet of columned paper for working out things like simple budgets or projected business costs. Maybe you just want to keep a record of your normal home expenses or business costs. If you didn't have a computer, you might go to a stationery store and buy one of these columned pads. Well, that's what a calc program is, an electronic columned pad. Now, if you filled out one of these pads and then discovered that some of your figures had to be changed for any reason, you would have to start all over again and fill out a new sheet. With a calc program in your computer, you just change whatever figure you need to change and the computer will fix up the rest of the pad. And even though you can only see a few columns over and a few rows down the page, you can get over 63 columns across and 255 down, or more. You just have to imagine that you're holding a magnifying glass over a columned page, highlighting the area you're working on. Well, when you look at the CRT, you're focusing on the part of the pad you really want to see. Financial professionals use these worksheets to prepare statements, budgets, compute ratios, and modify projections in seconds rather than hours or days. You can use the same program just as easily to figure out your monthly food budget. List your expenses. Or project your earnings and costs on a project. So much for calc. Then there's database management. Sounds like a pretty impressive program. And when you consider what a simple program it is to use, it's pretty impressive. I'll give you an example of what it is and how it works. Think of that filing cabinet you have at home or in the office. It's filled with drawers that are filled with labeled file folders that are filled with files. It takes up a lot of space. And if you accidentally put the wrong piece of paper in the wrong file folder and that in the wrong drawer, days. Weeks and months could go by before you find what's missing. And what if you need information from several different files grouped together in a particular arrangement? More time and more work. 
What can a database management program do for you? I'll give you an example. Suppose you have a collection of magazines and professional journals. However, your collection is spread out all over the house and all over the office. Suddenly, you're looking for an article on butterfly collecting that you read last summer. With your database manager program, you will have listed all the magazines you got in that year. You've listed the month you received them, the table of contents, and where you put them all. You simply command the program to scan for the word butterfly because you're not even sure of the title of the article. The scan might even turn up some other articles on collecting that you'd missed or forgotten. Now here's another thought. Your Christmas list, file cards, virtually anything that you want to keep track of fits into a database management program. That's a nice card. I must remember to send that out. It's not that much trouble to keep the information in the computer. You could type it in a little at a time or all at once. It doesn't really matter because once it's in there, it's in there to stay and you can start using it immediately. Now, word processing is probably the most popular program for microcomputers because it allows you to turn your computer into an electric typewriter that does a whole lot more than any electric typewriter. You could write anything from a shopping list to the great American novel, fast and cheap. You see, the word processing program uses a process called text editing. That just means you can edit, delete, change format, move entire blocks of copy, and correct it dozens of times, search for a specific word or phrase, and store it forever on disk. You can reshape it 150 times if you'd like, without putting 149 pieces of crumpled up paper in the wastebasket. In fact, waste is a word you will rarely use when you get a word processing program for your Model 4 microcomputer. And when you do, typing will never again be the same. Beyond these three programs are many more. In fact, there are well over a thousand different kinds of computer programs you can use to make your work go faster and your spare time last longer. To learn more about the kinds of software that might fit your needs, just check in with your local Radio Shack Computer Center. Now that we've covered the more popular software programs, you'll find it helpful in understanding all software if you have a hands-on idea of how it is written and how it works. There are many languages that are used for writing software. You've heard us talk about BASIC, Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code, so we're going to teach you how to write a very simple program in BASIC. Now, don't worry. There are only four lines in this program and very few terms to learn. This little program is designed to convert your age from years to months. Now, here are some ground rules about BASIC programs. There are a series of instructions that tell the computer to do things in a certain order. So each line of instruction is numbered. That way, the computer will know what instruction is to be taken first, second, and third, and so on. Here's what the actual program looks like written in the basic language. Notice how the lines are numbered 10, 20, 30, and 40 instead of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Very often programmers write programs numbered that way in case they want to add lines in between later for more instructions. The first line is an input statement. That's why it says input right after the number because you're going to put in some information. In quotation marks is a message that will be put on your screen before you type in your input. The statement asks you to enter your age in years and months. So if you are 25 years old and six months, you would type in the number 25, a comma, the number six. When we run this program in a few minutes, you'll see what we mean. The semicolon next to the last quotation mark on the line tells the computer there's more information coming. The Y, followed by a comma, and the M are what are called variables. That just means that the values assigned to those letters can vary, just like people's ages can vary. The Y stands for years, and the M stands for months. The next line, number 20, looks like an algebraic equation, and it is. X, the unknown, will be equal to Y, or years, multiplied by 12, the number of months in a year, plus M, or the number of leftover months. Notice we use an asterisk for the multiplication sign because that's the way the computer understands it. The next line, numbered 30, is a print statement. 
That means it will print information on the screen. The first line, the input statement, will also print information on the screen, but it requires you to put in some information. The print statement doesn't require you to add anything. At the end of the print statement, which looks very much like the input statement, is a semicolon telling the machine there's more information to come and X is that information. Remember to put in a blank space just the same way you did and for the same reasons you did in the first line. Also, don't forget, we've already told the computer that regardless of what numbers are put in for your age in years and months, X will be equal to the number of years multiplied by 12, the number of months in a year, added to the number of leftover months before your next birthday. The last statement, numbered 40, just says end, and that means we're at the end of the program. We'll leave the program up on the screen so you can try it out. Boot up your machine with the disk operating system. Then type in the word basic and press the enter key. You now have the basic language loaded into the machine. You don't need to load and run any programs. Go ahead and copy that program into your computer, remembering to press the Enter key after you've typed each line of instruction or program. Have you finished? If your version doesn't look like what's up here on the screen, press the Enter key, type in the word New, press the Enter key again, and try writing the program, remembering to press the Enter key at the end of each line. If you need to see the program again, rewind this section of the segment and view it one more time. When you're ready, type in the word Run and see what happens. Don't forget to press the Enter key. First, the machine asks you to put in your age in years and leftover months, leaving a comma between the number of years and months. Go ahead and press the Enter key. Now the machine tells you your age in months. Granted, it's a simple application of program writing. But this should give you an idea of how programs can be written in a general nature and still be able to be made very specific to your needs. Converting your age in years to months is general, but your age is what is specific. By the way, next time you're at your computer store, you might ask your dealer, what are the best of the microcomputer magazines for your computer? You don't have to understand all the articles in Byte or Personal Computing to appreciate the ads that keep you up to date on the hard facts about software. A couple of quick hints to keep in mind when you're shopping for software. Make sure you can try it out on a version of your machine before you buy it. Most stores will allow you to do so. That's another good reason for checking in with the store where you bought your Radio Shack Model 4 microcomputer. And when you do find a piece of software that meets your needs, make sure you make a backup copy right away. And now, a few final notes on Compututor. No single book or tutorial will ever meet all of your needs. And the best person to teach you about your computer and your software is you. Trial and error is still the best teacher. The intention of Compututor is to give you enough information to get your computer online and get you started. The more you run this program, the more you'll get out of it. After all, look at what you've accomplished in a relatively short period of time. You've learned to assemble your equipment, boot up your computer, load and operate the disk operating system, run and save programs, operate your printer, even write a piece of software. And your future is even brighter. As you continue to master new programs and new peripherals, you'll discover that your machine is merely a means to an end. It's a device that allows you to do the things you want and the things you do best. Make decisions based on having information readily available. In many ways, you are well beyond novice. And the next time you see a computer article in a magazine or newspaper, or hear people talking about their systems, 
you can participate from the experience of being a user. Not only does Compututor congratulate you, we graduate you. What are you, the Lawrence Welk of the Integrated Circuit? Take it easy. There's no problem with this deal, you know. Not even a party. No one's even going out for a hamburger. Hmm. Thank you.